up. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, good, good morning, everybody. Uh, initially, my title was the title of the talk was about the negative effects of continuous integration. But I decided when I was working on the, I was preparing the talk, I realized that all the possible negative effects I could group by maturity levels of continuous integration. And I just introduced these maturity levels. I want to introduce them to you and show how I, how I understand continuous integration, what levels we went through in many projects, and I'll show you what problems you may have in each of these levels. But first of all, my question to you is, who of you know actually what continuous integration is? Just a few. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's what they told me yesterday when I was like preparing for the talk. They said that some of the people here may not know what it is. So that's why I added one more slide to explain what continuous integration is. So continuous integration, just look at this diagram. I'm going to have just one diagram today. Uh, it works like this. When I'm a programmer, I'm working with the some code, which stays in some repository. And I make changes to this code. So I introduce, and how many programmers are here, actually? Who of you are programmers? OK, so you probably know what it is, what is repository. So I make changes to repository. I, uh, I change my code. And I want to be sure, as a programmer, that I don't break anything. So I want to be sure that every time I make a change, I, I fix something or I introduce new feature, I don't break the entire product. That's why the continuous integration was introduced. So we, that's me on the left on the diagram, and there's a repository on top of me, so I make changes to the repository. And then I configure and set up a server, which is called continuous integration server, which every time after my change, it gets the whole code from the repository, the entire project, and tries to build it again tries to compile all the files, try to integrate everything together, all the components, to make sure that one little change didn't break all the components of the product. And then if it breaks, or if it doesn't break, it gives me the information, me and the whole team, it shows what actually happened. So ideally, in a properly configured everything, and if I'm like a disciplined programmer, I don't make, make, make uh, mistakes, then the continuous integration server will always indicate the green flag. It will always, always show that everything is clean and the product is still buildable. And it doesn't happen always. Sometimes continuous integration server raises red flag. And that's when the team has to do something and, and fix back the problem which I just introduced. It's called continuous integration because it does it, first of all, continuously. So every time we make a change, it, 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 it runs this cycle continuously nonstop. So it works in day and night every time. It doesn't work on demand. It works automatically and continuously. That's why the first word, continuous. The second word, integration, because it puts all the pieces together no matter what piece I changed. So if I change just one file, it's going to put all the pieces together and integrate the whole thing together. That's why continuous integration. That's the idea. Is it clear so far up to this point? OK. So there are eight maturity levels, maturity levels, which I think, which I observe and I see in my, in my projects. The first one is that when you just have the source code and you don't have anything else beside that. So that's how we, like, all the programmers usually start. So you just open the, the directory on your computer, then you put some, let's say, Java files, and, and, that's, and that's all you have. And how many of you actually write Java code? And what other languages do you use? Just, just five people here. What other languages? C Sharp, Ruby, Python, Python Go. Bash. All right, yeah, the Bash. Bash is also a language, that's right. <laughs> okay. So when you start the code, when you start the project, you have the directory with some files, let's say Ruby files, and then you have some IDE to manage these files. You know what IDE is, right? Some, for example, you can use them from, what, what IDEs do you use? Just for me to understand. All right, Eclipse, anybody? JetBrains products? Okay, good, IntelliJ, great. OK, so you have the folder. We have the directory with files, .java files. And you have the ID on my computer. I just change these files. I compile them by clicking the button compile or package. And I get the product. This is the first level of maturity. And at this point, you probably can configure some continuous integration. But this is just you, just your computer. There's no server. This is just the base level. It's not so interesting. The next level is when you introduce some source code management system, for example, Git. And I'm mentioning Git because I think this is the, this is the standard de facto, de facto right now. And while there are other systems which exist, for example, Subversion, Mercurial, or some commercial systems. But I think that's my suggestion to you, is that the Git is the main thing to use right now. And if you use something else, I would suggest you to move to Git as soon as possible. And also, I would suggest to use, and, and my question is, how many of you, I'm going to ask you now from each maturity level to the next one, I'm going to ask you questions, and I want like honest answers. How many of you don't use any? Think like Git so far. 
So how many of you just keep files in the directories, on the computer, but not in the repository? None of you. So all of you use something like Git, right? Am I right, or are you not just being honest? <laughs> OK. OK, and do you use anything besides Git? Who's using Subversion? Still a few people. OK, and you're planning to move to Git, or no? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I would suggest you have to move to Git because this is, again, the standard de facto and it's going to be, I think, the main thing. And also GitHub. I'm not promoting these guys. I'm not, they're not paying me. But I think GitHub is the main platform for now and it's going to be the platform for the future. So I would suggest to move to Git and GitHub at the same time. Well, I'm using GitHub. I was using Subversion before, but Git is way better. So there are problems. When you start moving from just files to repository, you will have a number of problems. The first one is that the team will, especially when you move, for example, yeah, from, from just files, programmers usually forget to put their code into repository. This is a very typical problem. That's what I've seen many times. So programmers work on the code, they work something on the local computer, and then by the end of the day, or by the end of the hour, or by the end of the week, they forget to put this stuff into repository. And then the manager is like asking, like, hey, did you forget to put your code? Oh, yes, I forgot it, sorry. And sometimes people even, they commit on the local computer, but they forget to push to the repository. That's also a typical problem, which I've seen many times, which is a problem of moving on the next maturity level. How to solve that? Well, I, I don't know a good, well, some people I've seen, they're making some, some kind of a punishment. So they're saying, like, if you don't commit your code by the end of the day, then something will happen tomorrow to you. But I think it's not going to work in, on a long scale because on a, on a big, on, on, on long term, because this kind of punishment is, doesn't really motivate people, doesn't motivate programmers. So we in our team, we, in, our, in our projects, we kind of tried and it, it worked to teach, prog to teach programmers how Git works, like in the internals, not just, not just the tool which they are uh, required to use, but it has to be the tool which they love to use. And to, to love Git, you need to understand Git. So that's the suggestion for those of you who are planning to migrate from subversion to Git or using Git and not happy with that. I think the main problem with Git always is that people don't understand how it works. It's quite a complex system and you need to understand the internals of it, how it actually manages files and what these, hash, hash, what these hashes are and how this whole thing works. So my suggestion is to, to teach programmers and to train them, not to punish them. The second one is conflicts. So when people stop working with just files and move to repository, they realize that there could be some conflicts, especially when their team is working together. So I'm changing something, and then my, my colleague is changing something, and we're touching the same file. It's going to be a conflict. And I have to be ready for that conflict, and I need to know how to resolve it. That's the second problem, which sometimes turn off people from Git and from repositories, and they're still working like with files, but just committing their code to like once a week. This is not how it should be. So when you're using Git or any other source code management system, you're supposed to make 10, 15, 20 commits a day. You cannot commit just once a week. This is wrong. So you have to make many, many multiple commits, sometimes many commits an hour. That's how a normal programmer, a programmer who loves Git and understands how it works, that's how it should happen. Many multiple commits an hour. Like every time you change something, a little bit here, a little bit there, you're supposed to commit and commit. People are not doing that. Again, what's the solution? Books, trainings, make them love Git and understand what the Git is the, is the help. The Git is your friend. It's not the tool which you just need to put your code in because your manager said so. It's your tool. And the, sec the, 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 the last problem about Git, which I've seen many times, is that people don't understand that the Git is basically for text files. It's not a repository for binary files. So you're not supposed to put there like huge jar files or huge zip files. This is not how Git works, and this is not how actually GitHub is uh, designed to work. So you are supposed to keep only text files in your repository, and everything else should go to other repositories, to some uh, maybe Artifactory or some, you know, you can put an Amazon S3 somewhere, but you're not supposed to keep binary files in Git. And also, people don't really know sometimes what's the best way to organize the repository. What's the good layout for the repository? How these files are supposed to stay together? And, and how to organize them? Because when they work in just, just files on the local directory, it's one thing. But when it's a repository, it's supposed to have some discipline. It's supposed to, be, to have some layout, some, some the design of, of, of files, which is some people miss. Again, what's the problem here? What's the solution here? Uh, in our case, we in each project, we introduce some kind of a policy. So we're saying this is the short document which explains how you're supposed to use our repository for all programmers. You're not supposed to put that kind of files in here. You're not supposed to, to move files in that way if, if they're supposed to, to stay that way. 
All that things, they have to be explained. So you need to give programmers a policy. Or if you are a programmer, just design it for yourself. That's it for, for the problem number two. So this is the maturity level number two. If you have the Git, if you have the source code repository, you're on the level number two. And then you move to level number three, which I called automated build. In this case, you still have files. They stay in the repository. But then you introduce some, some script or use some tool. For example, if it's Java, you can use Maven. If it's Ruby, you can use Rake. If it's Python, you can use, what's for Python? I'm not writing a lot of Python. Say again? Yeah, for example, yeah. So there is something, in each language, there is some tool which will help you to, uh, to get your files in automated way. So it will help you to get all your files from the repository and build everything together, test everything, and produce the result. So, uh, and, and that tool, why do we need these tools? Why can't we just write a bash script, for example? Because these tools are just making our life easier. It all started with the Make tool for Linux. Make is really old and really powerful tool. And all the modern tools are way easier and way simpler than Make, but they are easier to understand and easy to use. For example, Gradle for, Maven, for, for Java or Maven for Java. And for all languages, there are different tools. And we need to use it. You don't want to compile everything manually or from the IDE. You need to be able to go to the command line and say, git pull everything, so get everything from your repository, and then just give one command, for example, make or MBN or uh, rake, and then just one line, you click enter, and everything ha happens together, and you get the final product. So you get the jar file, or you get, uh, I don't know what you get, or zip file. You get something which you can put to production. So it has to happen in one line. This is absolutely mandatory. This is what is called automated build. So your build is automated if you can build it in one line, in one command. It can be just multiple commands. It can be just, I run this, and then I run that, and then I put this file over there, then I recompile, and then it's ready. This is not an automated build. Automated means that it's always one line. And there will be problems. If you try to do that, there will be definitely, um, there could be serious problems with, first of all, with other programmers, with the team who is working with that. Uh, first of all, the problem is that it's not so easy. It's really not so easy. When the project is young, when you're just starting to, to automate things, then it will be easier because you just get this tool, this Gradle, for example. You just get an example from, from the book or from the internet. You just put it in your, in your repository, and it works just like that. But when the project is kind of old and it has like hundreds of thousands of lines of code, there are so many dependencies and so much mess inside, then you just cannot build it in one line. Just this, this Gradle or Maven or anything will not be enough, will not be powerful enough to do what you were doing before when you didn't have the automation. So it's going to be a problem. It's going to be difficult. And sometimes, I've seen it many times, people solve that. And, and the problem is that the team who is working on that doesn't have the skills for that. So they, this, this automation of the build, it's a different set of skills than programming. So one thing is writing Java code. Another thing is building Java product. It's a completely different set of skills. Some programmers are good enough to, to keep them together, and they know both. But most programmers, they're just writing Java code. And when you ask them, like, OK, now you have to build this whole thing in Maven, they say, I don't know Maven. I don't know how to write this XML configuration of uh, 5,000 lines of code. This is not what I do. All I do is just I go to IntelliJ, I click package, and it's packaged. So this is a different set of skills. And I've seen many examples when people invite other specialists or the experts to their projects, and they ask them, the only thing to do is just spend a few days and just get, get our code and automate it. Like, make sure that all we have is buildable in an automated way. This expert comes in, automates everything, and walks away. And this automation, this script, this Maven script, stays with the project. Nobody actually needs to understand how it works in details as long as it works. If it stops working, you can just in invite the same expert in like half a year and ask him to fix, ask that person to fix that again. So that's the solution which I would suggest to use in most cases. If you don't know how to do it yourself, don't spend a lot of time on learning because there's a lot of things to learn. This is not really an easy task. It's, it's probably as big as programming. There are many, many tricks, many, many different concepts which you need to understand deeply in order to automate properly. So I would suggest to get an expert. And another problem is that so-called it works on my computer. So in most cases, programmers say, yeah, I have this code. This is my ID. It works for me. I click package, and it's packaged. What do you want from me? And then another programmer says, yeah, but it doesn't work for me. And it is supposed, in this case, it is supposed to start working on the server. So I, I'll be the number three person which gets this whole code on some server, which runs not Mac, but Ubuntu, for example, or some other platform. And then I'm supposed to be able to, to build everything 
and I can't. What do I do? Who can help me? These guys, they don't know anything because they have these Mac, Mac, Mac OS computers and, and it works for them and they don't know how to fix it for Linux. So again, the solution here is the same. So ask somebody who will, who will come in and fix it for you. So that's level number three. So if you're on the level number three, you have automated build. You can't build your, your, your code with just one line. You just say Maven or Gradle and boom, you get the final product. Then, you mean, then it means you're in maturity level number three, which is a lot of achievement, which is really, and the question is how many of you are not on this level yet? Be honest. So all of you have this automated build. I don't think so. I don't believe you. <laughs> not all of my projects are fully automated. Come on. <laughs> okay, you don't want to be honest. That's okay. Let's go deep. Let's go higher. <laughs> Let's go to higher levels. The next level is pull requests. I'm sure not so many of you use that. So pull request is a feature introduced on GitHub, and this is really popular for, I mean, for open source projects on GitHub. That's how people, that's how people usually uh, bring their changes to the repository. And in order to do that, they, they work in branches. Who knows what branches are in Git? Okay, 50%, that's good, maybe more. So the Git is designed to be, to be managing branches. So this is, this is where Git actually starts to shine. Without branches, it's just a simple storage of files, which is not so, which is not so, I mean, there is no such, a, such many, so many benefits of using Git. When you're using Git and GitHub, you must use pull requests and branches. The idea is quite simple. I have my, we have the repository. We, as a team, we have the repository, which, is, which, is, which stays on GitHub. And I want to make some changes. I make a copy of this repository to my account, which is called a fork in GitHub. And then I create a branch in this fork, which is, which is the, a copy of the master branch. So there are, there are many branches of the same code in Git. And I get a copy of the master branch, and I call it my own branch. For example, I'm introducing the new feature number 15. So this is the branch number 15. And then in this branch, I make all the code, I make all the changes. I'm not afraid to break anything because I'm working in my isolated branch, so-called. So this branch is just a copy of the main, of the main, of the main piece of code. So the code stays in the master branch. I get the copy. I make a copy. This is called my branch. I make all the changes here. And then I suggest a pull request to the main repository. And I'm saying, hey, guys, I mean, guys, I don't know who. It doesn't matter for me. That's the main repository. I'm just suggesting I just made a few changes. I changed a few lines of code. How about you pull my changes and, and make sure that these changes are now in the main repository? And then the, who's the maintainer of the main repository? Probably the architect or the, the, the main guy of this, of this project. Uh, that person just looks at the changes and can accept them or reject them. And, and that's, a, that's a really beautiful way of isolating programmers. It's not only about GitHub, but GitHub actually made it quite easy. But in general, it's the, it's the, the idea, the, the, um, the mechanism of isolating from programmers from one to another. So I'm working on my branch and I have no problems, no conflict with somebody sitting next to me on the next, on the next desk working on probably the same piece of code but on a different branch. I will submit my, my pull request and that person will submit the pull request. So it's going to be two pull requests but we're not going to conflict between each other because they will be separately, individually, in an isolated way reviewed and then merged. That's the, the, the technique which is called merge. So these pull requests, they will be merged into main repository. How many of you are making changes to your repository through pull requests? About a half. That's really good. I, I was surprised. I asked you how many of you know what continuous integration is, and just 10 people said yes, and now you know what pull requests are. It's kind of mismatch in my, in my brain. <laughs> it's supposed to be the other way, not the other way around. Okay. So um, when you start introducing pull requests, there will be problems. First of all, the main problem is that it's going to be extra work for programmers. These pull requests and these branches, they, they obviously give you a lot of uh, freedom, a lot of uh, uh, confidence of your changes, a lot of uh, safety in making changes, but it's an extra work on every, on every branch because every branch means that you need to make that branch, you need to make the changes, you need to do some command line things on your, on your computer when you switch between branches, and then you need to create the pull request. This is just extra clicks and clicks and clicks. This is definitely extra work, especially for somebody who, who has never been doing that before. So if somebody, the new programmer, just goes into the project, I've seen this many times, and we just say, you know, we are working through pull requests, and it's, it's kind of a frustration in the beginning. Like, why do I need to do so many operations? I don't like them, I don't understand them, I don't really, like, appreciate you, like, pushing me, pushing me and making me do this pull request. So that's going to be the problem, definitely. 
And uh, the only solution which I think is gonna help, that's my, my suggestion to you, is to try to, the punishment is not gonna work, like with Git, again. It's not gonna work because nobody will love that mechanism if you just make them and, and enforce people to make these branches and tell them this is the only way to go. We're not gonna discuss it. So the right way, I think, is to, that's what I've tried and it works, is to motivate programmers by successful merges. So somehow tell them or motivate them or I don't know, give them candies or money or something for each successful pull request they introduced and it was merged. In that case, they will see that their result is actually measured somehow by the successful pull request. That's how it happens in open source. When you're working on open source, if you want to contribute to the open source project, you just go there, you submit a pull request, and you sit and wait, especially if the project is huge, you really think it's a success when your, when your pull request is merged. This is a huge success, especially when the project is big and popular. So I know well, it works the way it works for me. So when I find a big project, I find a bug in something really big, and then I make a pull request, I submit it to them, and then I'm sitting and waiting, will they accept it or not? And if they accept, I'm so happy. The same should happen in your like, local commercial project. People should be somehow, by, I don't know how you do that, but they should be happy when the pull request actually gets into the repository. That's the way, in, in that case, they will do all the extra work voluntarily. They will understand that they need, they, they need it for themselves because they are motivated, like, like in the open source stuff. I'm motivated, I have no problem with making the pull request, I have no problem with this extra work because I know that my code will be in this, I don't know, in a, in a big repository, in a big project which, which is known for the whole world. So the same you should try to build for your, for your private project. Um, and another, the second problem, the last one here for pull requests is that sometimes people, when they work on the branches, they work on isolated branches, sometimes they're trying to merge their stuff into repository and they can't. They can't because some conflicts, because the code doesn't look good, because somebody says we're not gonna merge that. And in that case, the branch stays longer and longer unmerged. It stays in my account for longer and longer and then at some point of time I realize that there is no way for me to merge it because the repository is already way ahead. So somebody else merged some other stuff and, and I cannot basically merge my, my stuff in there. It's too late. And in this case I just throw away my code or it's really difficult and it's really frustrating for me to make these changes and keep the branch up to date. Without branches it's not happening because we all can push our stuff directly into repository. No branches. I'm the first one. Boom, my code is there. I, I, I will not have any delays. In case of branches, the delays will be huge. So again, how to solve that? I think the solution is the same. Motivate people by successful merges. If they have successful merges, they will do all they can to put their stuff as quickly as possible. That's level number four. Let's go to the next one. We have eight in total. Level number five, code reviews. How many of you in your teams and your projects actually have code reviews for pull requests as a discipline approach? Oh, that's great, perfect. Say again? Well, at, well, I'm talking about the discipline process of code reviews. Yeah, that's the different things. Yeah, the question is the started code reviews or finished code reviews? Because yeah, some, some, <laughs> some people don't finish code reviews, they just, but it has to be discipline the process. So you have to do, this is level number five. You have to look at this, you have to have some protocol, some process, some formal, uh, uh, formal method of of who will look at this pull request and who will make the decision whether the pull request is good or there are some changes to be made. And this is called pull request, and this, this, this process is called code reviews. And the GitHub is really good for that because they have this, they, they have this pull request and you can actually make comments to, to any piece of the pull request and say, I, do, I like your code here, but I don't like your code over there. And then the author of the pull request will, cha will make changes, improve it, and then the code review will continue, and then eventually it will finish, and then the code will go to the repository. So this is a really important step for the, for the, for the higher maturity of, of, in, of continuous integration in general. So like you see, we're talking not about technical things as much, but more about cultural things and, dis and, and process things about continuous integration. And I think, like, I think yesterday somebody said that continuous integration and DevOps is more like a culture than a technology, and I totally agree. Continuous integration is as well more like a cultural thing than actually purely technical, like code reviews. There's nothing technical there about. You don't need to use any special tools, even though you can, but GitHub is good enough for them. But this is more like a culture, so you need to uh, and, and I'm getting to the problem, to the, to the first and the main problem with code reviews is that if you don't have the culture, if you don't have the, uh, the spirit of our code must be code reviewed, code reviewed, then you may have people offended by certain comments made for their code. 
especially new programmers, but all programmers actually, new, senior, junior, doesn't matter. So they create, somebody creates, I create the code, I put my code in there in my branch, I send the pull request, and then somebody else says that, you know, you did something wrong, you have to redo it again. You have to work again, even though I think I finished my work. I love my work, I love my code, and then somebody, if it's somebody I respect, okay. But if it's somebody I don't really respect, then it's gonna be a problem. So I'll be a little bit offended by that. And I can sometimes say that, you know what, I don't want to redo that. How about we discuss who is right, me or this person? And I've seen this many times, probably you've seen that too. And the only thing, the only solution for that is to make some sort of a policy which says how we resolve that conflict, how we resolve that situation. So who is, the, who, is the, who is the main guy here, who is the boss, I mean technical boss, and how we, how we deal with uh, comments which are not, uh, which are not liked by, by the authors of the code. What kind of policy you we have, I don't know. We ha you're gonna have, I don't know. But we need to have, you need to have some policy in order to avoid these people being offended. Because this, it's not about being like personally offended. This really creates a lot of frustration for programmers if they see that their code, their changes, uh, are being reviewed in a non-constructive way. So if the code review is done constructively and, and the proper mistakes are fo found and the properly explained and I understand why my code is not perfect and what I need to change, then it's good for me. I grow as a programmer. But if I know that the person who is making comments just making that because he wants to make or she wants to make comments, that's a different thing. It's a different thing. It really makes me sad and I don't want to continue to work on the project. So this focus on that and make sure you don't have that kind of a problem. That's level number five, and you said like 50% of you actually on that level, which is great. Level number six, we have eight in total. Level number six is tests, unit tests, so-called, integration tests, all kind of tests. You probably know what it is, and the question is, in how many projects, who of you actually write tests in a, in a, in a systematic way? A little bit less than code reviews. Good, so we're getting higher and higher and less and less hands being raised. So tests, unit tests, integration tests. The difference is not so big. The unit tests are actually testing, usually unit tests are testing just isolated pieces of code. By integration tests, they're trying to put together a number of pieces of code and, and test them how they work together. But in the end, it's still just tests. There will be three problems when you start introducing tests and start working in this test-driven development or just making tests. The first one, you, you're built, the timeline, the time which your build takes will start to grow. And it will grow, like really seriously grow. So when, when you don't have tests and you build a big project in Maven, for example, even if it's big, like, I don't know, thousands of files, the still, the build will take less than a minute. Sometimes, like, if the machine is fast, then it's gonna be like 30 seconds, 40 seconds. When you start introducing unit tests, it's gonna be 30 minutes, 40 minutes. So it's like really huge difference between no tests and tests. And that's a big problem, which actually turns many people off the continuous integration. They say, we just cannot work like that because every time we build the whole project together, it takes 40 minutes. And we can't just build on every change. We make like five changes an hour, and each build takes 40 minutes. So what can we do? It's too long. So how about we switch off this continuous integration server or just ignore it because we don't, we don't, we, it just takes too long. The only solution, the only answer, here, well, there are many answers, actually. The, but the first one is make your machine bigger, make it faster. The second answer is make your tests run in parallel. So they, they should use all the cores on the machine and run in parallel. But the best solution, the best suggestion is to break down your project into smaller pieces. So don't keep thousands of files in one repository. If your repository contains so many files and so many tests that they all together run for 40 minutes, it's a big problem. Just break it down into pieces. So the normal time, the maximum time, I would say is about 10 minutes. So if your whole, the, the full build, including all the tests, integration and, non -integ and, and a unit tests, take more than 10 minutes, then it's a problem. So break it down into pieces. That's the only solution, I, the only practical solution I can give. The second problem for the tests is that your build will become unstable. Without the tests, the build will always, in most cases, will be quite stable. Because if you have like a thousand Java files, then you run the Java compiler, it compiles them and you get the final result. What can go wrong? I don't know, probably nothing. So if you run it today and if you run it tomorrow, probably if it compiles today, most probably tomorrow it will compile as well. If you have a thousand tests over there and then you compile it now, then most probably it will not compile tomorrow. Well, depends on the quality of your tests, but most probably if the tests are not of high quality, then the, the build will be highly unstable. 
So you will not know what's going on. Sometimes it fails, sometimes it breaks. And you as a programmer will not know, is it my mistake or is it just unstable build? Who knows about that problem? Who sees that in, in your projects? Okay, not so many. All right, so this is new information for you. So this, the build will become unstable. Just get ready for that. The more tests you have, the, more, the less attention you pay to, to making your tests really isolated and, and properly configured and, and, and stable, then the more problems you will have with continuous integration. And if your build is not stable, then the whole continuous integration idea will not work because you cannot trust that red or green flag it gives you in the end. So you put some changes into the code, the build, the, the continuous integration server builds everything, and there's a red flag. Did I make the, 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 the mistake? Did I break something? Or it was just broken? Or it's just unstable? How to fix that? Um, the best solution, actually, I think, is try to make it as, um, as fragile as possible. For example, run your tests not one by one at the cell, always, but run them in a random order. So run them randomly. So it's, it's, it's easy to configure in Maven, for example, and say, I have a 1,000 tests, but every time you run them, you have to run them in, the, in, in, dif in a different order, which will make your build more fragile. It will, in the beginning, it will fail more often, and you will see that it fails, and, it, and, and you will fix it, and you will fix it, and you will pay attention to the stability. Because if you run them in the same order all the time, then uh, they, they may depend on each other, and they may work in that particular order. But then suddenly, tomorrow or in a month, I introduce some extra test, which will jump into this flow of tests. And then another test will break. And I will not understand why it breaks, because I didn't change it. I just introduced another test here. But the test, I, I put the test number 15, but the test number 55 suddenly breaks. I don't know why it happens, because the whole thing is unstable. But if there is no specific order of this test, if they run in, in randomly, then this 55, the, the, the test 55 will fail tomorrow, and somebody will fix it. So try to make it as fragile as possible. Um, and also, the, the another problem is that the test will become, that they, they introduce, the making tests will obviously make a development slower. Because every time, if you ask your programmers to make tests for your code, then it's basically slow down the whole development. That's level number six. Level number seven, we have eight in total. Static analysis. How many of you have static analysis built into your automated build? Just a few people, great. But it has to be there. Static analysis is, uh, uh, it's a, usually it's a tool which looks into your code and says whether the code is properly formatted and whether it looks good. So the code still works. The bad code works and the good code works, but the good one looks better. The static analysis is the tool or a set of tools which look into your code and say where exactly you didn't properly format it or maybe you used some wrong convention or you named your variables in the wrong way or you put too many methods in your file or you put too many lines of code in your file. Just, uh, just um, uh, the, the mistakes which are, not, which are not the mistakes for a compiler but the mistake for the style of the code. The static analysis must be in your build. And again, the only problem here, which I see, which if you try to introduce it, if you start to introduce it, the development will slow down significantly. Because programmers, everybody will just understand that I cannot make, I cannot introduce any piece of code which doesn't look good because the whole build will fail. And they will start complaining because they will say, my code works. Who cares how many lines I put in the, in the file? Yes, okay, it's a little bit more than your static analysis allows me to do. But the, the code works. What's more important, the, the working code or the beautifully, or the good looking code? So you have to try to, again, the solution here is you try to explain your programmers that this is really important. The quality is the main concern for you, and the code must look good. Sorry, we're a little bit out of time, so we're jumping to the level number eight, and I'm finishing. And now I think nobody will raise their hands. So who is using pre-flight builds? Good, we got to the level number eight. So pre-flight builds uh, is uh, the idea to solve the main problem of continuous integration, as far as I understand it. When I put the code to the repository, and continuous integration server builds everything, and tells me in the end, in, in 10 minutes, that the changes you just introduced are not good for us. You just broke the code. I made some changes, we put it into the repository, we did everything which we did before. The code review, the tests, the static analysis, blah, blah, everything, everything, everything. And I still put the code in the repository and then the repository breaks. Well, the continuous integration cannot build it anymore because I just made a mistake. And there is a red flag over there. The, con the server says the repository is broken. The problem is that what, it's too late to do anything because the entire team 
continues to work with the broken code. So I just broke the code, and everybody else cannot do anything. They cannot trust the code anymore because the repository is broken. They cannot run the tests. They cannot run the build because the build is broken, and it's too late because the code is already in the repository. And what happens in most cases, in most projects I've seen, is that people start, start to ignore this information from continuous integration server. So the server says, your code is broken, but everybody says, who cares? Yes, it's broken, but who cares? We need to continue the development. We'll fix that problem later, because we cannot stop. Like, it's, it's quite popular book, Continuous, deliver, uh, continuous uh, Delivery by uh, Jess Humble. Uh, uh, and, and the book says, literally, that when this happens, when I make the change in the code, and the code breaks, and the continuous integration server says that the code is broken, uh, everybody, the entire team, has to stop working on what they're working now, and they fix the problem. But in reality, it's not happening. Nobody wants to stop the entire team, 25 people working, and fix the problem one person introduced. It's not happening in reality. Probably, I'm, I'm, I don't know about your projects, but in all our projects, it's just not happening. Everybody says, like, we don't want to stop. We need to continue. And the solution for that, the solution for that, for, for making it actually work, this continuous integration, is to introduce pre-flight builds. Pre-flight build means that I have my pull request and I have the repository. I cannot technically put this code myself in there. There's, there has to be another server in front of me which gets my code, r tries to merge it together with the main code, runs all the full cycle, and if it looks good, it merges the stuff into it. So we have two servers now. One server which post-checking and one server which is pre-checking. So before I can put my stuff into repository, it tries to run the full cycle and prove that my code is good. If it can't prove, if the code is broken and says, no, we're not going to allow your broken code in the repository. We don't want this red flag afterwards. We want this red flag before. And that's what pre-flights build are for. So I think this is the, 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 last, the last level of maturity for continuous integration. If you have that pre-flight build, the whole continuous integration cycle will work for you in a stable way. This is my Twitter. Follow me. I write about that stuff. Thank you very much.